Hi, I'm Ken with Orion Telescopes and Binoculars, and in this video we're going to be talking about how to choose a beginning telescope. Uh, as you can see, there's a wide variety to choose from. I've got a representative sample of uh, a bunch of different types of telescopes around me here, and the choice can be pretty daunting. There's three things you want to ask yourself uh, when buying a telescope. Uh, the first thing is uh, cost. How much do you want to spend? If you are just getting into it and you're not sure if it's going to keep your interest, well then you probably don't want to spend a lot of money. Uh, but a simple small telescope like this that's very affordable can get you into the moon and planets. You can see the craters on the moon. So uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money in order to see uh, some nice things in the sky. The second thing is the aperture or the diameter of the telescope. Here we have a 90 millimeter diameter. Uh, and diameter is the most important thing. The bigger the telescope is, the more light it lets in, and the more resolution you've got. Because everything gets better with a bigger telescope, except for the size. And that's the third thing, uh, the physical size. If you go out and buy the biggest thing you can, uh, and then realize it's way too heavy for you to lug in and out, and it just sits inside, well then, what good is it as a telescope? So definitely uh, think of the physical size and how much you're going to be lifting and putting up, uh, setting up every night. So uh, ask yourself those three questions and then you can narrow it down to some, uh, a, a good choice for yourself. Uh, let's go through some of the different designs and see what each uh, one has in terms of advantages and disadvantages. The first type of telescope is a refractor design and here we have two, uh, two refractors, a 70 millimeter and a 90 millimeter, larger diameter. Uh, refractors uh, use glass lenses up in front and the light travels down straight through the tube going uh, one way once down to the elbow down here at the bottom. This is the 90 degree star diagonal. And then it comes up to your eye. So a very simple system. It's probably the oldest type of telescope uh, design out there. Uh, and it has a very clean image. Uh, a well-made refractor is nice and sharp, got high contrast, it's very bright uh, for its aperture. Uh, these type of telescopes are usually on the smaller side because big refractors get pretty darn expensive. So you usually see refractors in the 60 millimeter, this is a 70, up to maybe 120, 150 millimeter range, like four to five inches. Anything bigger than that, it moves to a different design. A refractor is great for moon and planets. It's got a lot of, like I said, high contrast. So rings of Saturn, uh, cloud belts on Jupiter, excellent. Uh, the, the moon, it's gonna look like you're in orbit around the moon. I mean, you'll see all sorts of craters and mountain ranges. Uh, refractors also serve dual purpose. You can use them for daytime viewing. So if you have a window with a view uh, out that way, you want to see the boats on the bay or the hikers on the mountain, a refractor does give you an upright image. Uh, it may be reversed depending on what comes with it, but you can always get a different prism to get a fully corrected image for daytime viewing. Uh, and the last advantage of a uh, refractor is that there's hardly any maintenance. You don't have to align uh, mirrors. I'll talk about the mirrors of a reflector later. You do have to align those. These you don't, so there's, there's basically no tune-ups necessary. Just keep the lenses clean and uh, free of fingerprints and you're good to go. So here we have the reflector design. Uh, this is a four and a half inch reflector, this is an eight inch reflector. Now reflectors are great, they probably give you the most bang for your buck in terms of uh, price per size and aperture because mirrors are very cheap to make, you can get them very large. Uh, remember I said refractors, you don't see them up above about four to five inches without getting crazy expensive. Well reflectors take over after that point. Uh, so minimum usually you see a three or a four and a half inch reflector and then it's very common to see eight, 10, 12, we have them up to 16 inch sizes. So they suck in a lot of light, good for uh, very faint deep sky objects, uh, the Orion Nebula, well that's a bright one, uh, the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda Galaxy, those are the showpiece objects that would look great in a larger reflector. And then there's thousands of fainter things that if you get away from the city lights are visible through some of the larger uh, uh, reflectors. How it works, uh, the light comes down through the front opening, goes to the very back, there's a parabolic mirror back there. It bounces it back up to the secondary mirror, which is sitting at a 45 degree angle here, and then it comes out the side to your eye. So a very simple system, there's just two surfaces uh, of, the, uh, of the mirror system itself. And like I said, you can get very big apertures for lots of light grasp and lots of resolution. Uh, I think I forgot to mention planets too. Uh, big aperture not only can see the faint things, but planets are very good. Uh, very high resolution for Saturn's rings, for cloud bands on Jupiter. Just an excellent all-around telescope, the best bang for your buck, uh, the reflector design itself.
Well, this is the third type of telescope design, the Cassegrain. Now, this one happens to be a Mac Cassegrain. And what differentiates this from the reflectors and the refractors is the internal design. It's got a mirror, like a reflector, in the back here, but it also has a lens up front. And uh, compared to a reflector where the light goes down, back up, and then out the side, with this telescope, the light goes down to the back mirror, up to the secondary that's uh, silvered onto the front of this glass here, and then it goes directly back through a hole in the middle of the primary mirror to your elbow and to the eyepiece here. So it looks small and short, but it actually has a very long focal length. Uh, this one happens to be 90 millimeter diameter, but it's got a 1250 millimeter focal length. So very long focal length folded up into a small size. Uh, this actually is a longer focal length telescope than that long refractor that you saw earlier. So Max and cast grains in general are great for uh, being very compact, obviously. So when you travel, you can take this on the airline with you. Uh, it doesn't take up any room in the car when you go camping. So a great portable design telescope. Uh, these also happen to be, since they're so small, uh, they're very good at being tabletop. And this model uh, happens to be a tabletop. It sits on any flat surface that you've got, uh, the patio table in the backyard, um, the bed of the truck if you just if you need something, a little rock, you know. Um, it will fit, like I show it here, onto any photo tripod. So if you've got something for a camera, just attach it on, and now you've got a dual-purpose telescope that's not only uh, capable of fitting on a table, but if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you don't have a table, you can use it as well. So overall, a very great portable telescope. Uh, this 90-millimeter Mac is great for seeing the rings of Saturn, moons of Jupiter. It's a little small for the big uh, the, the nebula because it doesn't suck in a lot of light, but there are bigger versions of this. Max, uh, we have them up to 7-inch diameter, which can suck in the light. So a very good portable telescope. You also should decide on what type of a mount you want to use uh, with the telescope. Uh, the telescope sits on top of the mount, so obviously the mount is what moves it and uh, follows things in the night sky. There's two main types. The simplest form is the alt-as, that's altitude and azimuth. Altitude is up and down, and azimuth is left-right, so for sure we call it an alt-as mount. Uh, it's very simple, you just plop it down outside and you're ready to go, there's no aligning necessary. But to follow something in the sky, well, the sky moves in these big arcs from east to west, and in certain areas that can be a circle. So to follow a planet with this one, you've got to move it a little up, a little to the left, a little up, a little to the left. You're kind of stair-stepping uh, or moving in diagonals uh, to find things. It's not difficult, it's just you have to grab it and move it in both axes manually. An equatorial mount here takes that in con into consideration and uh, moves with the Earth's rotation. There's a little more setup involved, however. This is the equatorial head here. This is the right ascension axis. It has to point directly towards Polaris. So you've got to locate Polaris, uh, which actually is not so difficult. Once you find it, it's the only star in the sky that doesn't move. So once you find it one night, you know exactly where it's going to be from night to night. You align this axis with Polaris right here. And then you can move the telescope on top of it in the north and south direction and the east and west direction. Now notice in certain areas it moves in an arc. So you have to kind of get used to a different coordinate system. It doesn't move straight up and down, left and right. If I wanted to move it down from here, oh, well, I can't actually do that. I have to move it to the side and then down like this. The advantage is, once you've found something, uh, let's say I'm looking at Jupiter right here, I lock it down, I can use the slow motion knobs to fine tune the positioning, and then as long as it is uh, polar aligned, all you have to do is twist this one knob here and you can follow the object as it moves through the night sky. So we've talked about the Altaz mounts, the equatorial mounts. Uh, there's one other thing you might want to consider uh, when picking the telescope, and that's if you want a computer system or not. This telescope has a mount that is fully robotic. You punch in what you want to see into the hand controller, and it will go and find it for you. Uh, it takes all the guesswork out of locating some of these hard-to-find objects and puts it right in the field of view, and it will track it as it goes through the sky. So you have to uh, initially point it to two stars, and then from that point on, it knows where everything is. So let's say you wanted to see um, the Orion Nebula. 
uh, Punch-In M42, or if you don't know the name of it, uh, or the number for it, you can look it up in a book. The database has all sorts of different uh, catalogs in it. Hit enter, it will go to it, it'll center it, and then it'll track it as it goes through the night sky. So people ask me, well, isn't that better? You know, that the computer will take all the guesswork out of it and make it easy to see things. Well, that, that's true, uh, but there's two schools of thought on um, computer control. Uh, first of all, half the fun can be the hunt for the object. So this will take that part of it, uh, that part of the fun out of it. Uh, but there's uh, half the people don't want to spend the time looking for the object, they'd rather spend the time looking at the object. And in that case, uh, this makes it a breeze. Uh, you don't have to spend the time hunting for it so the kids may not get bored you know, before you found the object. Uh, it, it's a very cool system that is very accurate and will find anything you wanted to uh, point at. This is the Orion Observer 70 millimeter Altaz refractor. Uh, it's a nice beginning model telescope for people that want to see if they are going to hold an interest in the hobby. It's great for the kids if you want to get it for present just to see if they're going to be interested or for the adults if you don't want to spend too much money and uh, see the uh, rings around Saturn, uh, moons of Jupiter, no problem. Uh, you can also use a refractor like this, like I mentioned before, uh, for daytime viewing. Uh, out of the box, it's an upright image, but it is reversed left and right. All you need to do, if you wanted to like read the names of the boats out there, uh, for instance, is just get a different prism on the back and you have a fully corrected image. So a very versatile telescope for daytime use and for some basic solar system astronomy. This is the Orion X-T8 Classic Dobsonian Telescope. It's probably my favorite telescope out of all of the beginning telescopes that I've talked about in this video. Uh, it's an 8-inch reflector on an Altaz mount. Remember I talked about the up and down, left and right method of moving it. Well, this is called a Dobsonian telescope because it's on a Dobsonian mount, which is just that simple swivel mount using nylon and Teflon bearings to get a very smooth, nice motion. I talked about reflectors being the best bang for the buck. Well, a Dobsonian is in the reflectors, the best of the best bang for the buck, if you can say. It's a very large aperture for a very good price. You move it around manually, which you'd think might be kind of difficult, but with these smooth bearings, it's actually easy, even in high power, to move this along and to track even a planet uh, and keep it in the field of view. So eight inches uh, sucks in so much light, you can see all the Messier objects. That's a collection of 110 of the best deep sky objects moon and planets. Uh, if you get away from the city lights, there's thousands of more objects you can see as well. So uh, as long as you don't mind the size of this thing, and yes, it is a little bulky, but as you can see, it really doesn't weigh all that much. Uh, in two pieces, I, I just lifted it in one piece, it's about 40 pounds. But in two pieces, you're only lifting the tube, which is about 20 pounds, maybe a little slightly under. Uh, the base is about the same. So it's very manageable. It sits in the trunk of your car and uh, is very easy to travel with you when you go camping. Uh, all right, well, that's the X-T8 Classic Dobsonian Telescope, one of my favorites for nighttime astronomy. All right, well, there you have it. Hopefully, uh, this video has uh, kind of narrowed down your choices to uh, uh, something that sounds like it would be the best fit for you. Uh, I know, like I said before, there's a lot to choose from, uh, but different uh, needs for different views of the sky you know, will affect what you're going to pick, whether it be something small, something very uh, large to suck in the light, uh, or something when you're going to be going camping and traveling. Uh, hopefully this video has helped you out. Thank you very much. Clear skies.